Could we please, hello, calling the house to order, please. Sir, please sit down. Thank you. Sir, please sit down. Please sit down. This is a community candidate forum. Please sit down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your spirited debate. Thank you, folks. For the folks who are not abiding by the rules, can you please step outside? We are running behind schedule. Can we get some order here, please? schedules to organize this. And I want to thank all of you in the audience for participating. Uh, welcome to democracy. That's what this is all about. And this, uh, this brings back very many fond memories, first and foremost, of the 200 plus forums that I attended as a candidate last year. I kind of miss going to these forums, so really glad to be back at one of these forums. And number two, you know, these are these people who voice their opinions, I think they're certainly entitled to, like everybody else, 
to voice their opinions. Uh, I've been told that they are part of my friends at the Falun Gong who have been following me for years, uh, mainly because they firmly believe that I am a communist spy from China. <laughs> you can make your own conclusions like, like you like. But in any event, I'm very proud to be here to see such an incredible turnout right here in Queens on one of the most important elections in this year's, ele in, in, in this year's election races. Uh, I am running for state senate to represent most of Northeast Queens, a number of diverse neighborhoods from College Point to Little Neck to Floral Park and Bellrose to Kew Gardens and Briarwood. It's a large area that encompasses about 370,000 residents here in Queens. Now, there are lots of issues that I know I'll be asked about, and so I, I've just been told I have 20 seconds left. Are you sure? All right. It goes I, by fast. All right. I didn't, I didn't know what the rules were. Nobody told me what the rules were. In any event, uh, I am looking forward to answering. <laughs> five seconds left. Uh, I'm looking forward to answering your questions, and once again, thank you for being part of this democratic process. from James Hong from the Ming Kwan Center. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, Mr. Liu. Um, to the audience, uh, I'd just like to say um, the, you know, we had a, a bit of difficulty uh, getting uh, even started, and so because we didn't have time for the audience questions uh, for the first candidate, uh, we have gotten requests that, uh, that we do not have them for the second candidate or the third candidate. So I, uh, I really apologize that uh, we will not have time. Uh, but in the interest of fairness, uh, candidates are very interested in how much air time they get. And uh, we want to be equal uh, to all the candidates. So um, for that, I apologize. Um, uh, and uh, we'll just go forward from there. So uh, Mr. Liu, um, our question from the Ming Kwan Center is uh, about good government. And one way to lessen the influence of corporate money in politics is to boost the value of small individual campaign contributions through public financing, such as a matching system. New York City also uses such a system, already uses such a system for its city elections, but New York State does not. Do you support comprehensive campaign finance reform with public financing of elections at its core? And if you do, um, and if there's any tweaks you would want to make to the uh, city system, please uh, say that as well. Uh, minute and a 15 seconds for each question series. You're a pro at sound. Okay. okay. <laughs> Get it going. Uh, I fully support public financing of campaigns at the state level. I think the concept has certainly worked at the city level and being a candidate for city office many times, I've always participated in the public finance system. But there are changes that I think are necessary to improve the process from the city, uh, from the city system. In the past, in past recent years, the city system has been somewhat arbitrary, governed by five individuals, three appointed by the mayor, two appointed by the council speaker, who I think at some times are influenced by politics. Hence, last year's campaign where they outrageously and unfairly denied my campaign of three and a half million dollars of money that my campaign was entitled to, I now have a federal civil rights lawsuit against the campaign finance board. So when we extend this concept to the state level, which I do believe we should do, we need to make a system that is going to be fully comprehensive and fair in a way that is not subject to the political tides of the day. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can to pass public finance at the state level for statewide candidates. Thank you. And he didn't even have to tell him to wrap it up. <laughs> well, these young people are very clear as to how many seconds I have left. That's right. Let's move on to our next panelist, please. Sir, introduce yourself and go ahead. Algo que me preocupa a mí y a otros inmigrantes y trabajadores de bajo salario de los mexicanos. Por favor, más demasiado, por favor. We will have a translator oh, okay. for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go slower. <laughs> Algo que me preocupa a mí y a otros inmigrantes y trabajadores de bajo salario es la manera en que el Estado permite que las agencias de empleo nos defrauden. Somos muy trabajadores y muchos de nosotros usamos a las agencias de empleo para encontrar trabajo. Sin embargo, las leyes actuales del Estado de Nueva York les da a las agencias de empleo el poder sobre los trabajadores porque les permite que cobren.
solamente a los trabajadores manuales antes de colocarlos en puestos de trabajo. Las agencias abusan de ese poder cobrando sin proporcionar un servicio de forma rutinaria, exigiendo precios exorbitantes por las colocaciones del trabajo y mandando a los, tra mandando a los trabajadores a trabajos que pagan menos del salario mínimo. Las leyes actuales de Nueva York, que no se han actualizado desde 1970, se podrían fortalecer con el proyecto de la ley S.7742, el Justice for Job Seekers Bill, patrocinada por la senadora Sabino. Mi pregunta es, ¿qué va a hacer para proteger a los solicitantes de empleo y eliminar la práctica predatoria de las agencias de empleo? Now I interpret for him. I, I got it. Perfect. Yes. Look, I, let me talk about what I've done already. As city controller, it was my job to make sure that the fair wages were paid to workers in New York City. And I'm a firm believer in prevailing wage laws, which are laws that the unions of this city fought long and hard for. But they fought for those laws and labor standards, not just for the union members, but for all workers. And regardless of whether you're immigrant or whether you've been here for 10 generations, an honest day's work means an honest day's pay. And that means... And that means we are going to ensure that that act that's been proposed at the state level will be passed. I will be a champion for that based on my record as controller, where in some cases we were able to get back from unscrupulous employers millions of dollars for workers that were cheated out of their fair pay. And so it is about outreach to the immigrant community. It's about working with our trade unions now who firmly believe that every worker should be paid fairly and treated equally. And also making sure that we have the compliance and enforcement mechanisms in place at the state level. Thank you. Uh, you were very right on the issue of um, workers' rights and employers, but we uh, a question is, so there is, uh, in New York State, current employment agency laws, which have not been updated since 1970, could be strengthened through Bill S-7742, that just is for job seekers bill, sponsored by Senator Sabino. Uh, the question is, what would you do for, to protect job seekers and eliminate predatory practices by agencies, by employment agencies? Well, and those predatory practices are very much spelled out in the unscrupulous, not spelled out, but exemplified in some of the, the exploitative practices by unscrupulous employers. So whether it be an agency or the employer themselves that then empower the agencies, we have a lot of compliance and enforcement work to do. That's a proposal that I do support, and I'll work hard to make sure that it passes in a democratic majority. Because let's get it Thank right. You. Thank in you. Many out of time, sir. I'm sorry. Let's move on to our next panelist. But thank you for respecting Thank you. Us. How much time do I get to respond to the follow-ups? I thought I had a minute and 15 seconds. She added a follow-up, but you really... So how much time do I get to answer the follow-ups? You got it. I promise you I'll be very fair. It's at my discretion. And I'm very discretion. Our next panelist, go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question and keep it very brief as we possibly can. Um, hi, I'm Kelly Ainsley, I'm a member and intern of China CDC. Um, as a tenant, I'm really worried about the next year, um, 2015, when the New York State rent and eviction pro uh, protection laws are up for expiration, um, that they won't be renewed or strengthened enough to protect the community that it belong to. Um, in 2011, though we did not gain all the changes we sought, actions were taken to strengthen the rent laws after a long time. Uh, we must continue to de demand um, for strengthened rent and eviction protection laws that will sustain an important source of affordable housing. So uh, my question is, do you support renewing and strengthening these laws? And if so, uh, what changes would you make to better protect tenants? And uh, would you withhold your vote on budget unless stronger rent laws were part of the budget deal in order to avoid an end of session crisis? And their, um, I mean, there. thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for that question, and the clear answer to all those questions and sub-questions is a resounding yes. Yes, I do believe in 
continuing the rent protection laws for the people of this city and state. Yes, I do believe in strengthening some of the provisions. I believe in repealing the Erdstat law so that we can determine our own destiny right here in New York City as opposed to relying on upstate Republicans to pass rent stabilization laws for the city of New York. And I do also believe in rate vacancy, in repealing vacancy decontrol, which is taking many affordable housing units <coughs> off the market right here in New York City. <laughs> now, I'm sure that my, my opponent has said yes to all of those. There's a couple of differences. Number one, I have the strong backing of Tenants Pack, which is the leading advocacy organization here in New York on behalf of tenants in the city and state. I'm very proud to have Tenants Pact's endorsement. Also, I am one, a Democrat who is not going to betray democratic values and ensure that there will be a democratic majority to pass all the pieces of legislation. Next question. Simple question from OCA New York. Do you support the New York State uh, Dream Act that will uh, <coughs> open the state funding uh, for all uh, New York youth and also raise uh, fund for a college scholarship? If you do, what do you do uh, other than just voting for it and to ensure the passage? Thank you very much. Yes, I absolutely support the DREAM Act, uh, as does my opponent. Here again, and I've often talked about how the DREAM Act is about giving opportunities to immigrants who have been here since they were little kids and they need to be able to access higher education. But it's a benefit not just to those kids, those kids and students. It's a benefit for all of us because as I have done as controllers issued study after study, that shows that people with college degrees and higher education will be far more productive in their lifetimes, they will make more money, so that expands our own economic base and tax base. So giving these young people a chance to pursue their higher education is not only good for them, it's good for all of us here in New York, so we should do it. But here's the difference. I support it, my opponent supports it. However, as much as my opponent says that he sponsored or supports the DREAM Act, he then went and empowered the Republican leadership that then made sure the DREAM Act went down in flames. That is the difference. And we cannot allow that to happen in this state Senate any longer. Good evening, I'm Andre Mazik, sitting in for uh, Donald McCaffrey of La Fuente. Uh, Mr. Lee, uh, briefly touched on our concerns regarding the minimum wage a little bit earlier, but perhaps this will give you a chance to expand. Uh, as you might know, uh, in Seattle, Washington, they recently raised the minimum wage uh, to a historic $15 an hour. Um, however, in the state of New York, unlike most states across the Union, cities are not allowed to set their own minimum wage. Uh, and we at La Fuente believe that this should be changed to allow cities and towns uh, to set a uh, higher minimum wage that better matches their local economy uh, and the cost of living. Uh, if elected, how will you use your office to help raise the minimum wage in cities and towns across the state? Well, I actually did not talk about minimum wage before. I talked about prevailing wage, which is far more significant than minimum wage when it comes to certain kinds of skilled crafts. And that's something that we need to continue and expand upon here in the state of New York. When it comes to the issue of minimum wage, I am so happy to see what's happening in Seattle and major cities across the country. Three years ago, as city controller, I conducted the analysis and issued recommendations for why New York City should have a minimum wage of at least eleven fifty an hour. And of course, the newspapers, uh, many of my colleagues in government, all the other people running for mayor of New York, they said I was nuts that we can't increase the minimum wage in New York from 7.25 to 11.50. I argue that you have to increase it because it does not make sense for government to mandate a minimum wage at which someone working full time cannot even get out of what government considers poverty. So you have to have a minimum wage that makes sense and 11.50 in New York City was the right number three years ago. 
So now we have other major cities that have far surpassed us, even though we have the highest cost of living in New York State and New York City. It's time to fix the situation. Let's pass a real minimum wage and stop letting the Republicans obstruct the vote on a real minimum wage increase. Question. Is there a statement afterwards? Or you made it. it. You made it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that might, that's half an hour. Do I need to be corrected? <laughs> no, not to him. <laughs> I was looking at the organizers. Jeez. <laughs> one minute afterwards? Oh, I stand please. corrected, Mr. Liu. You will get one minute afterwards. <laughs> Brian Chen, the Chinese American Planning Council. Uh, this question regards, is, is in regards to individuals with special needs. Individuals with dis de developmental disabilities such as autism, mental retardation, and Down syndrome are grossly underserved within our community. But despite their great potential to be active, contributing members of our community, Mr. Liu, please talk to us about your vision for people with developmental disabilities, specifically those that reside within the district that you hope to serve. Uh, well, when I was a member of the city council, I recognized some of the needs of our special needs children in public schools. I was the one that shepherded legislation that would require something as simple as school uh, air conditioning on all school buses to ensure that the kids are getting to school in a decent condition and that they're not spending hours on the buses uh, with in, in steamy hot temperatures so that by the time they got to school, they were in no capacity to learn anything. Starting from those school children to understanding that we have a growing number of group homes that are resident right in the communities that we live in. Those allow in the individuals to stay independent as well as to continue to either grow, develop, develop, uh, grow developmentally or even get jobs in the local economy. Those are all issues that I've worked on both as a legislator and as a civic leader prior to my being elected to the city council. A number of group homes do need additional assistance because funding at the state level has been decimated in recent years. So as state senator, I will fight to make sure that that funding is restored, not just for those individuals who need it, but for all the rest of us so we can live in a really comprehensive and cohesive society. And now that you've answered all their questions, you can go ahead and make your statement. Well, thank you very much. I am running for state senate to represent an area that I have lived in pretty much my whole life since I immigrated here at the age of five. I've lived in these, I've lived in the neighborhoods here, went to public schools, went to the parks, the libraries, enjoyed all the amenities, and it would be a tremendous honor for me to represent this area in the New York State Senate. I also run for state senate because there are significant statewide issues that have been stymied in recent years. We talked about a number of them minimum wage increases, the DREAM Act, worker protections, tenants' rights, and also one thing that was not mentioned, women's equality. We need women's equality here in the state of New York. Some very important measures that are not even part of New York state law and yet have been blocked by the Republicans because people like my opponent have joined with them to caucus in the state Senate. That has to end. We need to elect a real Democrat to the New York State Senate from this district, and I will be that real Democrat. Thank you very much.